Good afternoon guys. We're going to talk about peaks and troughs and why we measure levels in the morning. Why do we consider testosterone to be the important hormone when actually free testosterone, your bioavailable level, is more important when it comes to qualitative well-being? Well, I will tell you. Anabolic processes predominate at night time. So your body is busy repairing itself and preparing itself for the day ahead. So your testosterone level will be highest in the morning. Ideally, you should test your testosterone level between 8 and 11 in a fasted state because food can lower your testosterone level. We want to see how efficient your body is in producing testosterone. Why do we not measure free testosterone when establishing a diagnosis? Well, we do, but the NHS primarily uses total testosterone to establish a diagnosis because it isn't actually how efficient your body is. What we want to know is how effective functioning your HPG axis. So your hypopituitary gonadal axis. This produces testosterone. This is what we're actually concerned about. Now, progressive clinicians are concerned more about free testosterone and estradiol but you should not ignore total testosterone. The major glycoprotein that influences free testosterone, estradiol and DHT levels is sex hormone binding globulin. This grabs hold of testosterone, estradiol and DHT and acts as a buffer. It actually helps express testosterone in the cell so whilst you may have heard it grabs hold of that testosterone and prevents it from being used, that is incorrect. Testosterone, estradiol and DHT have very short half-lives. So if you think about the primary purpose behind testosterone, it is growth and repair. Now that has to happen 24-7, but predominantly at night time when you're resting. Whilst we talk about anabolic processes and catabolic processes being distinct, they are not mutually exclusive. One simply predominates at night time, anabolic, and conversely, catabolic processes predominate in the daytime. So what we should be doing is seeing how efficient the HPG axis is and also looking at the bioavailable numbers because these are the feel good numbers. These are the numbers that influence the cells of the tissues that testosterone, estradiol and DHT are supplying. SHBG influences this. So if you want to establish a diagnosis, you have to think about what you're trying to achieve. Now, the NHS is simply concerned about how efficient or effective the hypopituitary gonadal axis is. It isn't particularly concerned about how effective the thyroid is and other elements that contribute to free testosterone and estradiol. So you also have to think about utilisation. Now, as the day goes on, your testosterone levels drop. So there is diurnal variation. It's normally up to about 30%, which is more prominent in younger people than older people. And that actually is due primarily to sex hormone binding globulin, which rises with age. So you cannot apply that standard to somebody who is young, who has low SHBG. And people that have low SHBG tend to be the chunky monkeys 
with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, hypothyroidism, and also people simply with low testosterone. Because I believe that SHBG goes down essentially to help facilitate the release of free testosterone, estradiol and DHT so your tissues can use the testosterone, estradiol and DHT. There might be some barking. <coughs> Enough! Um, sorry, dog walked past. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, we measure levels early morning when they're at their highest to establish a diagnosis. When we measure levels whilst on testosterone replacement therapy, we measure them in a trough, so at their lowest level. Now, we are trying to achieve stable levels every single day. So we want to eliminate peaks and troughs. By the very nature of injecting a hormone, you will create a trough and a subsequent a peak. I meant peak and then trough, didn't I? Um, ooh, dogs. Um, so, why are we applying the same reference range when we're establishing a diagnosis when testosterone levels are at the highest and applying that standard to measuring levels on testosterone replacement therapy. It's because the processes are obviously, obviously different. It's hard work sometimes. So we are trying to achieve stable levels. The most effective way, I'm gonna say it again, is daily subcutaneous testosterone cypionate and HCG injections. You can achieve stable levels and create a tiny peak from injecting testosterone in the morning alongside HCG. So hence mimicking natural physiology. This is what we're trying to achieve. Now the sledgehammer approach that the NHS adopts is 250 milligrams every two to three weeks if it's a nanthate or nabido 1000 milligrams in four mil every 12 weeks by the very nature of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics you will have a big massive peak and a big massive trough so even if you have healthy levels and i mean proper healthy levels in a trough it's likely that your levels have been super physiological before this. Now we're measuring levels when we're making a diagnosis when testosterone at its, is at its highest and we're applying that same principle reference range to testosterone when we are injecting it. It's a little bit nonsensical but it is what it is. What we know is testosterone levels are dropping with time. We live in a sick society. Reference ranges are changing because people are sicker. We're not devolving or evolving to be emasculated Nancy boys. Um, testosterone levels are dropping. So how do you know that your testosterone level is too high? Now there are qualitative triggers, anxiety, a heightened state. I want you to be cool, calm and collected when you're resting and also cool, calm and collected when you need to be active. So it needs to be a choice. Normal testosterone levels give you the ability to decide how you want to interact with your environment. So you're not high and heightened constantly you're not low and miserable constantly you should be in the middle normal testosterone levels that get too high cause physiological changes so how do you know it's too high 
cognitive symptoms and physiological markers. I know when my testosterone gets too high, I become a whiny little bitch, and my hematocrit also rises. I know I'm well balanced when my emails are not as curt and inflammatory. Lydia no longer feels like she needs to get to emails before I've got to them. Apparently I've been a bit... Um, so I apologise to anybody who I've uh, responded to or whatever. But, um, namaste. <laughs> um, I now know what it's like to have PMT. Having that feeling that something is wrong but you actually can't control your actions. But having that insight means you can control it. But um, sometimes you just got to let it out. So normal levels should make you cool, calm and collected. That's what we're trying to achieve. Why do we not measure levels in a peak? Because everybody metabolizes, absorbs, excretes testosterone differently. And there are numerous factors that contribute to all of these elements. So we know that measuring in a peak will produce high levels. The NHS knows that injecting 250 milligrams of enanthate will cause a peak, a C max, of around 60 nanomoles per litre, which is absurd. So they don't want to measure levels in a peak because they will be super physiological. And if you know anything about the NHS, they do not advocate super physiological levels. But by the very nature of how they prescribe testosterone, it will cause super physiological levels as it peaks and levels will drop as the drug gets metabolized. And if the premise behind TRT is stable levels, irrespective of when the injection is or how close you are to the injection, it's substandard. So micro dosing is using the minimum effective dose in the most effective way to achieve your desired outcome, which is stable physiological levels for long-term physical and psychological well-being. Boom.